Welcome to episode five in this Every Move Explained series. And today we will see two chess legends, Bobby Fischer and Mikhail Tall, former world chess champions, will be playing against each other. Uh, this game took place in 1959 in Zagreb. Uh, in this game, Fischer was still quite young here, and he had a lot of trouble playing against Tall early in his career until he matured into you know, one of the best chess players of all time. And so let's begin with this game where Tall has the white pieces and he's playing against Fisher with black. And it begins with d4. And so here Tall decides to play d4, which usually leads to games that are more positional as opposed to an e4 opening, which is more tactical. But d4 also allows this bishop on c1 to develop. And d4 controls the center. And so Fisher, instead of countering with d5, he plays knight to f6 here. And this move develops the knight. And the knight controls the center here. It also attacks this e4 square preventing the knight or excuse me preventing the pawn from moving to e4 where the knight would capture it and so the game continues with c4 as the e4 pawn cannot move yet and c4 places another pawn uh, two squares forward where it controls this d5 square and if the d5 or sorry if the d pawn is pushed by black to d5 a outer pawn could then be exchanged for one of the more important central pawns and so the game continued with g6 and so this signals that bobby fisher intends to play the king's indian defense and here this pawn is pushed forward to allow this bishop on f8 to move into g7 where it will command this diagonal down through the center of the board and so now we have knight to c3 which develops a piece controls the center uh, it covers this d5 square and also it covers this e4 square which will allow white to push this pawn forward and so Fisher continues development, moving his bishop to g7, where it can eye the center of the board all the way down through to the queen side. And it also allows Fisher to castle fairly quickly. And so we have e4. This move controls the center of the board, and in the King's Indian defense, often we will have black developing his pieces and castling quickly at the expense of allowing white to control the center by placing all these pawns in the center and white will have an advantage in the center but black plans to counter this center later and try and prove that by pushing all these pawns forward they may become weak later and become targets for black and so here we have d6 which will allow black to later push either the c pawn to c5 or the e pawn to e5 and so play continues with bishop to e2 so here white develops the bishop it also controls this square on g4 here and if the knight is moved forward here it would prevent a pin by the bishop to g4 pinning the knight to the queen and if the knight was captured then the bishop could recapture um, instead of breaking the pawns up by capturing with the pawn but play continues here with castling by black so the king is put into this safe 
pawn structure and this fortress with all the pieces and pawns protecting the king. And the rook is moved from the edge of the board closer to the center. And now we have knight to f3, which helps fight for the center, controlling the e5 and d4 squares. And it also develops this piece off the back rank, allowing white to castle kingside. And so finally, black fights for the center with an e5 pawn push. And here, white will have a decision to either capture the pawn, ignore this, or push forward. And here, white decides to push forward which gives him more space in the center of the board. It kind of keeps Black's pawns and position more cramped. And in cramped positions, the side that is more cramped would like to exchange pieces off the board to alleviate that cramped position and allow the remaining pieces more room to maneuver. And the side with more space would like to avoid trades. Because of this extra space, his pieces have more room to maneuver, and by avoiding trades, it keeps the pieces that, uh, or that Black has in the cramped position. It kind of causes them to fumble over each other and have less moves available because they're so cramped. And now, we have knight at b to d7. So black develops this knight off the back rank. And it could potentially jump here to c5, but it also backs up this knight on f6. And next, white develops his bishop, pinning this knight on f6 to the queen. And so now we have h6. So this puts the question to the bishop of whether or not to capture or to retreat and keep this pin on the queen. And so here the bishop retreats keeping the pin of this knight on the queen here and here black has an option to push forward and break the pin and force this bishop to retreat but this may open black's position in front of his king too much so here black avoids pushing that pawn forward and instead plays a6 and so this move prevents the knight from jumping into this b5 square where it could potentially jump in here and attack this pawn, capturing and attacking the rook and causing problems for black. And so now we have castling by white. White's king is now safe behind these pawns and protected by the knight and his rook is moved closer to the center. And many times in the king's Indian defense games, there is often a fight for this F file where the F pawns will be pushed forward. And so many times it is possible for the rooks to stay on this F file as the F pawns are pushed forward in front of the rooks. And so here the queen moves to E8 to get out of this pin on the knight. And now we have a retreat by this knight that was on f3 back to d2 which will give more freedom to this f pawn to be able to push forward in the game and black does the same he moves the knight out of the way of this f pawn and allows this f pawn to push forward at some point later in the game and so here, white plays b4, which will build up pressure on the queen side and possibly reinforce a c pawn push to c5 in the future. If this is played now, 
it is not quite possible yet as we would just have c5 capture capture and the knight would recapture but this b4 pawn push prepares a future advance here to c5 and here black whose position is cramped decides to move his bishop to f6 attacking the h4 bishop of white and here it forces white to decide whether to retreat the bishop or to capture and so here we have a capture and after a recapture the bishops have been exchanged and so black's bishop was a bad bishop that was restricted by his central pawns being on the same color as his bishop but that bishop was protecting this area around his king and so it did leave a gap in the king's defenses by trading that bishop and of course it was white's good bishop which was on the opposite color as his central pawns here so whether the decision was good or bad to trade that'll be decided as the game proceeds further and so next we have a knight move to b3 where it backs up a possible c5 pawn push here and the queen moves to e7 to help prevent this pawn from pushing to c5 and so we see here and this happens a lot in games where the center is closed and the pawns are blocking each other uh, play many times will continue on the sides of the board and so the pawns this f pawn and c pawn they will have to maneuver around this blocked central formation and a lot of the play will revolve around this pawn push here on the c file or the f file the play will happen on the sides of the board with the locked center okay and next we have queen to d2 so the queen gets off the back rank connecting the rooks and giving the rooks freedom to move here and also this queen move attacks this unprotected pawn here on h6 and so the black king moves to protect this pawn and then we have the queen repositioning up here to e3 where it adds to this possible push of the c pawn to c5 now there is another attacker of the c5 square here and so here we have this knight on f6 moving out of the way backing up here protecting the queen which will come in handy later in the game as these pawns are traded away in the center and the queen is lined up on black's queen so this knight move protects the queen but it also allows this f pawn to be pushed forward and so here finally white pushes his c pawn forward attacking this central d6 pawn and now black ignores this queenside attack by white in favor of counterattacking by this f5 pawn push attacking white's central pawn and so white halts his attack on the queen side and attacks this pawn on f5 capturing forcing a decision to be made by black on whether to recapture with a pawn or with the rook and so here the decision is made to capture with the g pawn towards the center but it does remove and leave a hole here uh, on the king side which may cause problems later in the game for this uh, black king which doesn't have as much protection now and so here white pushes forward to gain space in the king side 
and stop this F pawn from moving forward anymore. And then after a capture here, the E pawn captures this F pawn, attacking White's queen, but we also have an opposition here between these queens, so White has to decide whether to capture the queen and trade queens or to move the queen, potentially just recapturing the pawn. But Tall, who was a great attacker, and his attacks were sometimes so ingenious and complicated that he was known as the magician from Riga, I believe, and he decides to keep his queen because the magician would like to use this queen later in some type of magical attack against Fisher, as we'll see here. So the queen recaptures, keeping the queens on the board. And then we have a capture here of this C pawn. And so instead of recapturing, Tall, who always likes to push forward with attacks, places this bishop on d3, which eyes the black king through this pawn here on f5. And so Fisher ignores the attack, gaining this extra pawn, capturing here on b4, and the knight is under attack as well. And so once again, White ignores this attack on the queen side and counterattacks by rook from a to e1 attacking the queen here. And so black's queen is under attack and must decide what to do. So the queen moves here, queen to f6. And so this is probably one of the decisive mistakes that Fisher made in this game. Uh, possibly better if we go back here after this rook to e1 move attacking the queen. Um, if we look at the computer evaluation, the queen, excuse me, the computer recommends that the queen moves to d6 here. Um, it shows queen to f6 is not bad as well, but if we play out the queen to d6 move, here it attacks the white queen and Tall decides to avoid trades once again but first he will attack with check and the king moves then we have another check and a block trying to trade queens once again uh, normally if your position is under a fierce attack and especially if your king is in the open Trading the queens can relieve a lot of the pressure of this attack against your king. But Tall, a great attacker, avoids this trade and just captures the pawn. And so this is how the game could have played out if that queen to d6 move was made. And Fisher once again, uh, possibly forcing the trade here with a check on the king and attacking the queen. So eventually we would have this move where he blocks the check and after a final, finally getting a trade, it would leave this position, which white has a superior position here because all his pieces are developed. And you see how the rooks are on open lines his knights are placed in better positions than blacks. And we have this bishop closed in and also this rook closed in. So positionally, white would be better here. And maybe that's why uh, Fisher decided not to go into that line. So if we go back and after the rook to e1 attacking the queen, Fisher decided against this queen to d6 move and instead moved queen to f6, which led to problems in the game. And so 
Here, the computer evaluation does not even show this queen to f6 move on the first three uh, best defenses. And so, in this position, after queen to d6, it appears that black would be behind almost a half a pawn. But after the game continuation, queen to f6, here we see that black is even worse. He's closer. Uh, the evaluation is still adjusting here. But he's over half a pawn behind. And so let's see now what uh, tall the magician from Riga decides to do to continue this attack. Okay, so Rook here moving up to e6, attacking the queen, and the queen captures here on c3, but Tall attacks, checking the king, capturing this pawn on f5, and we have a capture by the rook trying to eliminate one of these attackers, but the pieces are swarming around black's king. And so after a queen captures with check, the king moves, and it's starting to look uh, pretty rough here for black. The rook moves up, preparing to jump into the game, but attacking the queen as well. And so the queen cannot deliver a check to the king on the back rank as this knight covers a1, c1, and this rook covers e1. And so the queen must decide where to move now. So we have a queen move to b1 where it potentially eyes this square, although that is covered by the queen as well. So the queen is running out of moves here. Uh, from here, the queen could attack this pawn. And now we have rook to e8, pinning the knight to the king. And black's position is just really restricted here. And so black moves this knight to f6, where it backs up the other knight. It tries to block any movement by the queen and the rook on this f file. And the knight is backed up by the queen here. But it also has opened up a discovered attack on the queen by this bishop. But black is just tied up in this position. So here it looks like that you could have a possible trade here by a rook capturing on c8 and then if recaptures with the rook the queen could capture but according to the evaluation that continuation would only give white a slight advantage so in the game tall actually plays queen captures on f6 putting the king in check but also attacking the queen so the queen is forced to trade and the rook recaptures and this rook cannot be captured by this knight as there is a pin by the rook on e8 but also we have this pin on the c8 bishop which if it moves then the rook could capture excuse me the a8 rook and so the game continues with a king move, getting out of this pin on the knight, attacking the other rook, and then tall moves rook from f to f8. And here he threatens to capture the knight or the bishop, and these rooks work in tandem together, just putting so much pressure on black's position. And I'll play the rest of the game out, but black is just in too much trouble now. We have this knight move. So now if the knight is captured, the king could capture the other rook. 
but Tall instead moves his knight up to a5 where he can reposition this knight. And so Fisher, after running out of moves to make, just plays h5 as he cannot move this bishop or the rook will be captured. And here we have h4 per preventing any further move by this pawn. And then now we have a rook to b8 move. And so here Black is just in trouble. He's running out of moves. A threat earlier would have been this knight capturing on b7. And if the bishop captured, then the rook would have been captured. And if the bishop recaptured, this rook would have taken the bishop. So it just looks bad for Black. So a few more moves which play out with the knight repositioning towards the center. And then an attack by this b5 pawn push. The knight moves into the center, heading towards the Black King side. And from here, we have the possibility of rook to e7 with check and picking off this knight. And so Fisher resigned here. The attack by Tall was just overwhelming and Black's position was too constricted. And finally, Fisher just succumbed to this uh, onslaught by tall and so i hope you've enjoyed this demonstration of two former world chess champions bobby fisher and mikhail tall uh, from 1959 when fisher was just young and at this point in his career he was having a lot of trouble against tall but as we all know fisher went on to vastly improve and become world champion in 1972 and so I hope you've enjoyed this game this uh, series episode 5 of the every move explained series where these two chess legends battled it out and if you've enjoyed this video please like and subscribe and feel free to leave any comments or suggestions thank you and have a great day